Hallo, wir sind heute Abend im Hamburger Theater Kampnagel, wo bei dem internationalen Sommerfestival schon seit Wochen über das Thema Gemeingüter gesprochen und debattiert wird. Heute Abend liest hier Mandana Shiva, Trägerin des Alternativen Friedensnobelpreises und Mitbegründerin des World Future Councils. Sie stellt die Frage, wem gehört die Welt? Tonight you are talking about the question, who owns the world? And this is exactly my first question for you. Who owns the world? No one should own the world. Uh, we belong to the earth. To turn the earth, her gifts, her abundance, into private property is, um, in my view, an ecological crime. It's also a crime against humanity. Uh, because no one has created the life that companies try and patent. The companies that sell water as their property haven't created that water. Um, to create property in that, which is a common good, is a violation, both of ecological rights and the rights of Mother Earth and a violation of the others who are excluded from this construction. So I would basically say no one should own the vital resources, processes, gifts of the earth. We should share them as a commons and generate abundance through that sharing. I read or heard that you are saying that um, there are only a couple of enterprises who rule the, wo rule the world. Um, who are that enterprises and how does that system work? For most of human history, the vital gifts of the earth have been managed by women who were left to look after life. And it's only in the last two decades of the so-called free trade, new liberal thinking, the thinking of globalization, that corporations place themselves as owners of the earth's resources. Among them are the chemical companies that brought us the wars, the chemical warfare, and now say we are the creators of life. We should have patents on life forms and seed. These are five chemical warfare companies that are today the gene giants of the world, beginning with Monsanto, Syngenta, BASF, Dow, DuPont. These are the companies. Um, in terms of grain and food, companies like Cargill decided that they had exploited the farmers of America. Now they wanted to exploit the farmers of the rest of the world. And uh, the green giants are Cargill, who bought up the second big green giant, Continental. Um, it includes ADM. It includes Conagra, Bungay. In terms of water, the Europeans do it better than the Americans. <laughs> Most of the big water giants, except Bechtel, which is American, are European. Two are French, Suez and Viola. Um, a German water company and Thames. Uh, these are the big water giants. So in every sphere, you see five giant corporations trying to own control and commodify what is not a commodity and what is not private property. The, co the companies that rule the world are, are the one side and the other side are we, everyone, all the consumers and how they how they treat food. For instance, I read that more than half of the food in Europe um, is thrown away. This is a huge waste um, to all the people who are eating a lot of meat. They are wasting somehow grain because Obviously, it needs a lot of grain to raise cows and pigs and so on. So, in comparison, what are the more important, important um, reasons for causing, uh, for instance, famine? I think the most important reason for causing famine is imposing on the world systems of production that are claimed to produce more, but they actually produce very little. Uh, and they waste food at the level of production first. So, for example, the kind of farms we promote, biodiverse ecological farms, produce two, three, four, five times more food per unit acre than the industrial farms do. When you grow a Roundup-resistant crop and you spray Roundup, you're destroying food. That's the fir first food waste. And I would say that's 50% of what the earth could give to us. The next level of food waste is the fact that then this food is turned into a commodity. 
and it goes to run cars as biofuel it goes to force feed animals who never ate grain they all loved grass they're herbivores uh, you feed them uh, grain and that diverts food away from human beings and finally you allow speculators to bet on food that takes food away from people the issue of the recognition that there's so much food waste in the West is interesting at this time because we are being asked to give up our local food systems which have very little waste. If I don't eat something because my um, tomato went rotten, it doesn't go waste. Either it goes into compost or it goes into the stomach of a cow who's waiting next door to eat it. So in local systems, there's no waste. Everything is recycled. This. 50% food being wasted is a result of long distance transport, um, supermarkets who have best before and have to throw things away and that combination is an absolute disaster and they're forcing consumers to get involved by saying buy more, it's cheap, buy more, buy more, buy more and you buy 10 times more than you're going to eat and of course you have to throw a lot away. The industrial globalized system is creating hunger, it's creating famine, it's creating waste. Mm. And uh, waste and famine is, is, is one problem. Another problem of the Morgadon agriculture is that it, um, that it provokes uh, the global warming. So how does modern agriculture uh, cause this global warming? Well, I wrote an entire book called Soil Not Oil to deal with this challenge. I realized that the entire discussion on climate change had totally left out agriculture, both in terms of greenhouse gas emissions when you do industrial agriculture or as a solution, as an adaptation to climate change when you do organic farming. And if you add up the figures that are in the IPCC or in the Stern report or any report, 40% greenhouse gas emissions are coming from industrial globalized food systems. The same systems that lead to waste are leading to waste in terms of pollution of carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxide and methane. These are then changing the climate and by changing the climate they're creating more food insecurity. If you go organic, your soil becomes a major absorber of carbon. But it's not dead carbon, it's living carbon. The photosynthesis in the leaves of plants is allowing plants to absorb carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. The recycling of organic matter turns the soil into the most fertile sink. And if we start to do organic farming, we could get rid of 40% of the greenhouse gas problem. When the entire Kyoto Protocol only aimed at a pathetic 5%, which they didn't even reach. Mm, that's amazing, really. Yeah. During an interview with uh, uh, Spiegel Online, you said that the ones we are stealing the food from uh, will arise. And my question is, um, do you have the hope that um, after this kind of revolution or upheaval, we will live in more peace and harmony? Or to ask differently, um, what, what do you think we should learn? What do you think we should change? Yeah. I think the first thing is that after I did that interview, we've seen the uprisings in Tunisia, in Egypt, and it was about the price of food. They were carrying bread. People did rise. Now, of course, the media then turned it only into Mubarak, but people were on the, st on the streets because they weren't able to buy their bread. Um, people are rising. The point is, will this rising be a system transformation? Or will it be channelized into some tiny little change while the system is kept intact? And that question is answered according to how, how much solidarity these movements have, how much vision is exercised, but the most important thing is how pluralistic they are able to be so that every excluded voice becomes part of a deep democracy. How do you look at Europe? And what, is, what are your wishes or your advices or how do you see the people here, the companies, the activists, social movements, I don't know what. Yeah. I think at this point there are three Europes. There used to be one Europe. 
the Europe that tried to colonize us and a Europe that had a very, very narrow view of the world as just resources to be exploited. What we see today as this attempt to own the planet is a result of the beginnings when the territories of our part of the world were taken over as European property. Um, but today, there are three Europes. There, there's the Europe of the corporations who write free tra treaties, who would like to privatize our water, who would like to patent all our seeds and medicines, who um, confiscate our medicines when India sells generic drugs to Brazil for AIDS and uh, Rotterdam uh, port confiscates it because it is not patented medicine, but the law allows generic medicine. Uh, that's the Europe of the corporations. That Europe will continue to try and be a predator, both internally as well as externally. And that's the Europe of societies like Germany, which uh, still seem to have their welfare, seem to be doing not too badly. But there is a Europe I go to, the Europe of Greece and Spain and Iceland and Ireland. And that Europe is in a very deep crisis, in fact a much deeper crisis than the third world is in. Because it's a Europe that was used to a welfare state and suddenly the state is no more a welfare state but a corporate state. A state for subsidizing collapsing banks and the trade-off being forced on people is the banks must be bailed out and society can go under. Beyond a point you cannot do it and that's why the youth are out in the streets of Greece, they're out in the streets of squares of Spain with the M15 movement, the indignados. Um, there is a new uprising. It isn't just the Arab Spring. There's a spring on the streets of India, on the streets of Europe, and another world will have to come out of this. Either it will come through violence or it will come through non-violence. I prefer the non-violent part.